So I know I said I was excited when we got to enzyme kinetics, and I know I said I was excited when we got to redox reactions, but now I'm really, really excited. Finally, we're going to get into glucose metabolism. Everything we have talked about for the first whole half of this course, now we are 10 lectures in, so it's truly it's the first half of the course, everything we've talked about and everything we've discussed has been for the reason to get us to this first lecture of the glucose metabolism series. With the exception really of one of the remaining 10 lectures, everything we talk about for the rest of the semester is going to be about glucose metabolism in one way or another. So we're finally here. We're at the cusp of what we were meant to talk about. We will talk about glycolysis, which is chapter 17, and we'll be focusing on the first half of that chapter in this lecture series, the first um, half of the glycolysis reactions. Uh, this is going to be a short first chunk of this lecture. So this is uh, uh, lecture 11a, and it's going to be quite brief, just introducing you to the background concepts we'll be needing. And then the second chunk will be significantly longer, um, and that's it, just two chunks to this lecture series. So here we'll be talking about the general reaction types of glycolysis, and we'll talk about our roadmap, a figure from our textbook which is going to serve as our central roadmap as we go through the individual reactions of glycolysis. Uh, and all of that's going to result in us having a fairly comprehensive review of glycolysis as a process. The rest of this lecture series, so lecture 11b, is going to be the first half of glycolysis, which is called stage 1 of glycolysis. And then the next full lecture, lecture 12, will be the second half of glycolysis. So we, we break glycolysis up quite a bit. It's lengthy, it's extensive, and so we give it its due time. So as I already said, we're officially on the road of glucose metabolism, and we will spend pretty much the rest of the semester talking about how we start with consumed glucose and convert that into ATP. How do we take energy in a sugar form, which is stuck full of energy, but that's not really usable energy, and convert it into usable energy in the form of ATP? So we'll be talking about, I have here today and Wednesday, when this lecture and the next lecture, lecture 11 and lecture 12, will be all about talking about glycolysis. Uh, we give two full lectures to glycolysis. I don't mean lecture chunks, I mean full lectures. Lecture 11 and lecture 12 will be on glycolysis. So in general, to distill it down to its most basic uses, glycolysis as a process burns two molecules of ATP, but it produces four. So glycolysis makes us a net profit of two ATP molecules. We burn two, make four, so two of those are profit. That's not why we do glycolysis, though. That would be a pretty poor return. So those two ATPs are kind of like icing on the cake, but they're not the real reason we're doing this. The main reason we're doing glycolysis is to convert glucose into a molecule called pyruvate. Glucose is a six-carbon sugar. We established that in the last lecture. And pyruvate is made up of three carbons. So in fact, we make two pyruvates for every glucose consumed. We turn one six-carbon glucose into two three-carbon pyruvates. No carbons lost or gained in that process. So we take this. This is glucose. This is pyranose glucose, six-membered ring. And we're going to convert it into two of these. This is pyruvate, a three-carbon molecule. Cells do this because pyruvate is extremely useful. Pyruvate can go off and do many, many things. And so this is a very valuable molecule for the cell to have. We can see here that once pyruvate is made through glycolysis, and, and this first half of this flowchart is meant to represent glycolysis pretty crudely, vaguely, we see two ATPs are burned and two and four ATPs are made, giving us our net profit of two. Looky, looky, what else are we doing? We're doing some redox reactions. We're also going to begin the process of stealing high power electrons from that glucose molecule. So we're reducing two molecules of NAD, that's that niacin derived NAD electron carrier reducing it to NADH plus H, two of them. And then we've made pyruvate. Well, pyruvate can be used for a number of different things. It can be used for anaerobic metabolism. And this is the type of metabolism your own muscles do when you're near the point of exertion, when those muscles don't have enough oxygen to perform properly. You can see the end product of that road for pyruvate is lactate. This is the lactic acid that causes muscle cramps when muscles are overexerted. In certain microbes, such as baker's yeast, that same pyruvate can also go down a fermentation pathway where the end product there is ethanol. This is how beer and wine are, is made. But most of the time, especially in our cells, cells that are not anaerobic and stressed for oxygen, 
most of the time that pyruvate goes down a road of aerobic metabolism or aerobic respiration. And the next step of that road is the citric acid cycle, which you've probably heard of before. And from there we have oxidative phosphorylation, which essentially is the process of making tons of ATP using the electrons harvested through the prior pro uh, processes. And then if you look at the end of this pathway, really no surprise at this point, we give off water. We've discussed that a number of times now. This is our waste basket for spent electrons. Those energy depleted electrons were put onto oxygen. The protons followed and so that yielded water. And we also give off carbon dioxide, fully oxidized carbon, carbon that has had all of its electrons stolen from it. And what's interesting here is how many carbon dioxides are shown being released? You see six. So how many carbons are being exhaled? Six. How many carbons in glucose? That's right, six. And so really stealing my own punchline here eight weeks away, uh, these six carbon dioxides that we exhale, they are the carbons from glucose. They are the very same carbons in our consumed glucose, only they have had their electrons stripped away. So in aerobic respiration, the aerobic, the central part of this process, pyruvate is converted along the way into a three carbon molecule. Actually, that's, that's wrong. Uh, I apologize for that. Acetyl is actually a two carbon compound. And so pyruvate is converted into the two carbon molecule called acetyl. It's acetyl that can enter the citric acid cycle directly. So with that acetyl is linked up to CoA. We know what that's for. That's our coenzyme A. That's an activation step. So that gives us a clue into acetyl being very content and non-reactive by itself. So we have to pair it up with something awful, a horrible blind date like CoA, so that now acetyl will engage in the reactions of the citric acid cycle. So we're going to spend most of our time on this central pathway here. Most of our time is going to be spent on aerobic respiration, but we'll deviate once in a while and talk about anaerobic respiration as well, both in microbes as well as in our own muscle cells. In all of these reactions, as you look at these, you can see that we have redox reactions. Substrate is oxidized. And if substrate is oxidized, what is it that you see being reduced? And in this case, you see that NAD is reduced. So we're going to be dealing with a lot of redox reactions as we go through this process. So before we talk about glycolysis proper, let's just get our foundation under us, a solid footing to talk about things. And uh, really, let's talk about the chemistry we expect to see in glycolysis. This chemistry is going to be the way that we get from 6-carbon glucose to two 3-carbon pyruvates. And so what we really want to do is focus on reaction types. We want to understand, we, we want to be sure that we understand the different reaction types we will encounter. Luckily for us, there aren't all that many to remember. Um, cells don't really have all that many tricks up their sleeve. There are only a limited amount of reaction types in general, and even more of a limited number of reaction types that we encounter in glycolysis. So all that really changes are the substrates and the, and the products. The cells do the same type of chemistry over and over again. So it's important uh, that we focus on reaction types rather than the necessary details of each reaction because it's in the reaction types that we have some overlap and some commonality. Not surprisingly, each step of glycolysis requires its own enzyme, unique to its own substrate. And yes, in this case, I do want you to know the enzymes of glycolysis. I let you all skate with the amino acids, and that was because there isn't much value in memorizing amino acids. I'm not letting you skate here because there actually is a great deal of value in knowing the enzymes of glycolysis. You'll see that as we begin to go through the process. In fact, the enzyme names tell you everything you need to know about almost every step of the glycolysis pathway. So let's talk reaction types first. One of these reaction types that we encounter in glycolysis, we've already seen. Well, we've been into this lecture less than 10 minutes, and we've already been privy to one of the main reaction types we encounter in glycolysis, redox reactions. And you all know what we mean by that now. There are only five types of reactions used in glycolysis. That's it. It's a 10-step process but only five reactions are in there. And the first one we already talked about, redox. We also see phosphorylation reactions. We've talked about those in the context of sugars as well as in the context of, uh, of enzyme regulation. So we should know phosphorylation reactions now. Kinases add phosphate groups and uh, phosphatases remove them. 
There's a subset of phosphorylation reactions that are called phosphate transfer reactions. And phosphate transfer reactions are exactly what they sound like. This is when a phosphate group is donated by one substrate molecule and received by another. Literally, a phosphate is transferred from A to B. The second reaction type we'll see in glycolysis is isomerizations. We haven't talked about isomerizations yet in this class, although I'm relatively certain you've seen them before in previous chemistry classes. Isomerizations are nothing more than rearrangements of groups on the molecule. So this is one example of a simple isomerization. You can see that the only thing that's been isomerized in this case is this bond. This bond has gone from one configuration to another. In isomerizations, no atoms are lost, no atoms are gained. Uh, they're only rearranged within the context of the original substrate molecule. The third reaction type we'll see is a cleavage reaction. This is where the substrate is cut into two smaller products. Redox reactions, we've already said, are there. We know all about them now. And dehydration reactions, which also you're relatively familiar with. Uh, the formation of the peptide bond was a dehydration reaction. So too is the addition of a nucleotide onto the growing end of a DNA or RNA chain. A dehydration essentially is when one oxygen and two protons are removed from substrate and they come together to become water and that water is released from the reaction. So here is our roadmap. Again, I told you that glycolysis is a 10-step process. We can see that right here. Uh, the arrows are the steps, of course. The arrows are what are catalyzed by enzymes. So we have step one, glucose phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate. We said that this was going to be our first step of glucose metabolism in the sugar lecture, in lecture 10. We said that this phosphorylation occurs to make glucose reactive, because that phosphate group is negatively charged, and to lock glucose in the cell. Because if glucose is big, bulky, and negatively charged, it can't diffuse through the cell membrane. So we've even talked about this first step already. So here's step one, step two, step three. Step four is a cleavage step. Now we've gone into two tracks. Step five, step six, step seven, step eight, step nine, and step ten. So a ten-step process. We see at the end of that process, we have our two pyruvate molecules, which we've already discussed, two three-carbon pyruvates from that one six-carbon glucose. So this is our roadmap. This is how we'll find our way through glycolysis as we go. Also, from your textbook, this is figure 17.2, and so it's a handy thing to have since we'll be referring to it quite a bit in these lectures, and you have access to it yourself. Really a nice study resource, so something to be familiar with. Again, as I told you, we mentioned in the last lecture that the very first thing we do to glucose when it enters a cell is we lock it in there by phosphorylation, creating glucose 6-phosphate. We add a phosphate group to the sixth carbon of glucose. That phosphate is going to come from ATP, and that's our first burnt ATP molecule. The phosphate is donated by ATP. ATP drives this reaction forward, and so we yield ADP there with that third phosphate of adenosine triphosphate being the phosphate that we've popped onto glucose. Let's leave it at that. We'll pick up with the rest of the first stage of glycolysis in the next lecture chunk. Again, that lecture chunk will be a little bit longer than this one because we'll go into the actual chemistry of the first half of glycolysis, um, but I think it's going to be a blast. So tune into that next lecture at your nearest convenience.